doing the little things that you're doing. I just can't thank you enough. Uh, let's take your Bible, if you will. I want you to open to Romans chapter number 10. Now, this morning we got on the other voices. And uh, I think I've made that clear enough now that you saw from Genesis 3 uh, that those other voices can pretty much uh, be reduced to, if you're trying to remember it, those other voices can be reduced to earthly, sensual, and devilish. In other words, if it appeals to your flesh, you better be careful. Now, this afternoon, we had some folks that gave us uh, a great amount of food and things like that, and I didn't go to a restaurant, but food appealed to my flesh. That doesn't mean food's devilish, unless you can't take the feed bag off. Do you understand? So just because it appeals to your flesh, uh, my flesh right now would enjoy uh, about 68 degrees and a fan blowing in the background to drown out all the noise and some cold sheets. Yep. And uh, just a couple of hours of uninterrupted uh, sleep. Last night, I think, it's the first night she slept without the phone right there. She's been on call 24 hours for a long time now. And so you'd be surprised how you, you, you get to the point where you're hearing it in your dream. That's appealing to your flesh. That doesn't make it wrong. So it's not all fleshly things. You're a carnal person. Paul said that I'm, I, I have the liberty to do whatever I want to do. All things are lawful, but all things are not expedient. I'll not be brought under the power of any. So there's certain things that are appealing to your flesh and they're right to do. You've got to take care of yourself. That's nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with enjoying a, a, some time off and a vacation and some rest and those things. It's when that gets out of moderation and goes into excess that you run yourself into some serious trouble. So when I say that, earthly, sensual, devilish, those things will generally, you'll see them wind up, have some continuity together, and they'll all, they always seem to operate together. And before long, if you get earthly and sensual, you're literally one step from the devil. Yep. Uh, because that's how he'll come at you. And that I showed you this morning in Genesis 3. That's how he came at Eve. Now we've been talking about this. Let me read this to you so you can go ahead and sit back down. Look in Romans chapter number 10. And just go ahead and pick it up in verse number, uh, let's see, 1. This is the Apostle Paul. We're going to talk about him in a minute. We've been talking about Peter, but I'm going to get to Paul here. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer for God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have the zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law of righteousness to everyone that believeth. Brother Ernie, you pray, would you please, and ask the Lord to help us. You can be seated. Now, what you need to recognize is, is that when God made you, He made you a certain way. And there's certain things about you and the attributes that you have, whether you like it or not, it's who you are. And it's okay to be that way as long as you recognize not just your strengths, but also your weaknesses. You put both of those things under the blood and put them under control of the Lord. We generally have a bad habit. And I've told you before, the difference in a professional and an individual that's an amateur is that professionals wind up working on weaknesses. Christians rarely do that. Christians rarely look at the Bible. They're looking for the things they're doing right. They're not looking for the things they do wrong. One of the reasons they despise the Bible is because the Bible has a way of pointing and saying, Thou art the man, and we don't generally like that. That's how God talks. 
God goes straight to the point. He doesn't beat around the bush. He says, you have a problem, and here is the problem, and the problem is you, and whatever it might be. Understand this, that people are partially correct when they say, well, the Lord made me this way. He did, but He also made you with certain things that are in you that are what we'll call, for the sake of discussion, weaknesses. And those weaknesses have to be worked on. Those weaknesses are not sin in and of themselves, but they have the potential to turn into sin. They have the potential to wind up causing you great problems. I mentioned to you on Wednesday night when we were talking here, I mentioned to you about the apostle, or last Sunday I guess it was, that we talked about uh, the apostle Peter and how he had a problem with anger. I used also Moses in that illustration. That Moses, although he's somewhat introverted and somewhat quiet and somewhat to himself, Moses had some great attributes about him. And you wouldn't necessarily call Moses a very outspoken leader. As a matter of fact, Moses doesn't want to shine the light on himself. And when the Lord says, hey, you're the guy that I want to do this, Moses says, but I stutter and I've already messed up. I'm no good. You don't need to use me. I mean, I can't even speak a sentence without stuttering and stammering over my tongue. I don't believe you need to be using me. And besides that, it's been 40 years since I've been in the game. You don't want me to be in the game. And he argues with the Lord about it. And then the Lord says, no, I'm going to use you anyway. Moses winds up having sort of an introverted, sort of a quiet kind of a person personality, but he has a problem with his anger. Moses comes down off the mountain, he hears the noise of war in the camp, and the next thing you know, you see a flash of anger there, and he breaks the Ten Commandments out there, and just about curses and swears. Another time he comes down there, and he finds out that they're doing things that are wrong. He tells the Levites, put on your sword and kill everybody that's not on the Lord's side. Another time he comes down there and the people are griping and complaining because they don't have any water or anything like that. And the Lord says, listen to them, they're thirsty and uh, go down there and speak to the rock. And he gets there and he gets his dandruff up and he gets mad and he gets madder and he says, I'll be jumped, man. And he reaches out and strikes the rock and the Lord says, well, that's going to cost you a trip into Canaan, boy. You see, he's introverted, but he lets the stuff pile up on him. And then before long, you see an explosion. I call it packing the cannon. But you know, one of the things that Moses is given, a lot of people miss out on. Who did the Lord give all the intricacies of the tabernacle to? I mean, he might not have been the greatest, most extroverted leader. He might not be the guy that would be standing in a pulpit trying to give some great kind of a, of a speech or something. When Korah, Dathan, and Abiram come against Moses, you know what he does? He said, I'll meet you out at noontime. We'll let the Lord decide. I mean, I'm not. He doesn't defend himself. When um, uh, Aaron and Miriam come against him, you know what he does? He goes in and prays for him. I mean, he doesn't say, who, how dare you, and who do you think you are, and you're not going to tell me what to do, and the Lord put me in this position. When his father-in-law came out and says, hey, Moses, you're taking too much upon yourself, you need to do that, he's more swayed to, persuade, persuaded to listen to his father-in-law than to listen to the Lord, because it's almost like he's always trying to get out of, I don't want to be the leader anyway. But the Lord had him be the leader. He didn't get to pick that path. But boy, when it came to intricacies and delicacies and this needs to go here and the, the, the latchet goes here and coat this with gold and coat that with silver and make sure you get that out of badger skin and I want you to do this and I want you to... Boy, you talk about following a blueprint to the fair thee well. Moses had the ability to do those kinds of things. That's intricate detail. Can you see Peter doing that? I mean, think about that for a minute. Can you see Peter? It'd be like you trying to drive a finishing nail with a two-pound sledgehammer. I mean, Peter would be splitting wood and he'd be cussing. No wonder he's a fisherman. I mean, Peter's slinging stuff around. I mean, you've got a lot of room to make mistakes when you're slinging a net around and bang somebody in the back of the head with a thing and that kind of a deal. But Peter had a tendency to flash. Peter had a tendency. Peter didn't like to be told what to do. Peter doesn't, uh, isn't controlled very well. Peter's like, I got it. None of these other people. Peter sees himself as better than the other ones. You say, no, he doesn't. Yes, he does. You say, how do you know? Lord, though all others forsake thee, I won't. I mean, you're talking, I mean, he doesn't even just say it privately on Facebook or Instagram, Snapchat, something like that. He doesn't just say it on the telephone or to somebody secretly. You know what he says? Publicly in front of everybody. All these other scoundrels might leave you, but I'm not going to. Doesn't, whatever you're telling all them, Lord, it doesn't work. You know how Peter is? Peter's this uh, Lord comes up there, got him a wash basin, take his, uh, laid his garment aside there, and he picks up a wash basin and pours some water in there, gets him a towel, girds himself with it, and he gets ready to wash Peter's feet. Not so, Lord! In front of everybody. Talk about ruining a church service, man. <laughs> Peter stands up there. Not so, you ain't doing my feet, Lord. Ain't happening. Ain't no, you ain't doing it. 
Uh, Peter, if I don't wash your feet, then you're not going to be clean. You're not going to be with us. All right, wash me all over then, Lord. Big spectacle of himself, all that kind of stuff. But he loves real deeply. And he really does love the Lord. He just has a tendency sometimes to let his tongue get in the way and he trips over it on a regular basis. If you were to look at the Apostle Peter, if there's nine fruits of the Holy Spirit, there's probably three of them that Peter could work on that might be able to do him some good. Maybe some faith, maybe some peace, and maybe some temperance. You can't just cast Peter to the side because God used Peter as Peter was in that situation or set of circumstances with the skill set that Peter had and Peter ministered to people that God needed ministering to with Peter because God used him as Peter. God didn't turn him into a Paul. God didn't turn him into a Simon and God didn't turn him into a Matthew and God didn't turn him into somebody else. He used him as Peter. But here's the thing. Peter had to learn after John 21 when the Lord came up and dealt with him there. He had to learn to take those weaknesses and to submit those things to the Lord and admit, Lord, I got a problem with my mouth. I got to get it under control. Peter had a problem with his anger. Moses had a problem with his anger. I'll show you in a minute where Paul's got that problem. Well, the Bible says to be angry and sin not. I gave you the stuff on Sunday night there. I told you in that passage there where you got to learn to control that anger to make sure that you don't sin. Be angry and sin not. And then he says, don't let the sun go down upon your wrath. And in another place, uh, the unforgiving spirit. I'll show you this with Paul in just a minute. You say, well, I happen to be like Peter. Okay, good. That's not a bad thing. But do you have Peter's weaknesses? A couple of the weaknesses that I mentioned about Peter is, is that Peter could have a tendency at times, although he's cheerful and optimistic, there are certain times where he's egotistical and self-sufficient. Lord, I don't need what everybody else needs. I got it on my own. I'm, 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 I'm by myself. I don't have to have all these other people. I don't have the other uh, individuals. He doesn't take orders very well at all. Later on after, you realize this, don't you? He's already seen the resurrected Lord. And by the time you get over there to Acts chapter uh, 10, the Lord speaking to him from up in heaven, he says in a dream to Peter, a vision, he says to him, Arise, Peter, kill and eat. He still hadn't lost that. You know what he said? Not so, Lord. He said, I'm not eating those unclean animals. You know what the Lord says back to him? Don't you call what I call clean, unclean. He's dealing with them about Gentiles. That's right over there when he's getting ready to go see Cornelius. Peter hasn't yet had all the edges knocked off of him. Which reminds me to say this. Listen, it may take a lifetime before God gets you where he wants you to be. Yeah. Some sanding and some planing and some working on you and dealing with you and spending time. The greatest lesson teacher in anything that you do is failure. You learn a lot more from failure than you do from winning. You learn a lot more from failure than you do from success. Success does teach you some things, but the majority of us learn better from failure than anything else. Peter failed a lot, but the Lord still used him. What I'm trying to get you to see as I run down through some of these attributes of these individuals is you may identify with these individuals, but every single one of these individuals is not without sin, and every single one of these individuals have some great strengths, but they have some great weaknesses. And if a man is willing to look in the mirror of the God's Word and realize, Lord, i got some weaknesses, I need to work on it. If the Bible's right when he said, I can do all things through Christ that strengtheneth me, that means he can help you overcome those weaknesses. Maybe some of you are a little bit too introverted. And you hide behind it. And God says, uh, how about stepping out of your shell? You don't have to be a Paul. You don't have to be a Peter. But could you be a little better? See, there's sometimes being introverted is just a simply, it's a, it's a way of garnering attention. Because everybody's always trying to get you involved. It puts a spotlight on you. So can you work on it just a little bit? Can you submit the weaknesses? All right, this is the Apostle Paul now. There's a few things about the Apostle Paul. I'm prejudiced. I'll tell you right up front, I'm prejudiced toward the Apostle Paul. I think the Apostle Paul is the greatest Christian of anybody I've ever seen based on the things that I've read about his life and the things that I've seen him do and go through. I think the Apostle Paul is one of the most phenomenal men I've ever seen anywhere in history. 
I've read plenty of things about other people that are considered to be great men. I don't see anybody that even comes close to touching the hem of his garment as far as after who he was and what he was and where he came from. And once he met Jesus, there was no turning back. And he never did dip the colors. He never did uh, fold the flag under. He never did cut back and say, I wish I hadn't, I wish I hadn't, this and that and the other. It cost him everything. And God used the Apostle Paul like he was with all of his training and all the stuff that he had and then literally took him right out of where he would have been the most beneficial it would look like and put him around a bunch of Gentiles where all of the education did him no good at all. <laughs> you say what? Paul had to be taught that uh, weakness is strength. Paul had to be taught you can't rely all the time, Paul, on your education, your ability to stand by yourself. If anybody was ambitious, Paul is. Paul, if you take a look at the passage that you just read like that, there's no question he's uh, extroverted, he's ambitious, he's, he's uh, passionate, he's self-disciplined. He doesn't mind being dominant. He's very strong-willed. He's not uh, always uh, 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 the one that'll take off running when things don't go his way. As a matter of fact, in adversity, he's usually very successful. Adversity doesn't scare him. We'll look at that in a minute in 2 Corinthians 11. It doesn't bother him troubles along the way. Paul said, we did that, and we fought this, and we fought this, and we were surrounded by, they were trying to kill us here and there and that, but not discouraged, man, we're doing good. <laughs> My can back, Paul. You get your back beat open in Acts 16, you're over there in prison, and Paul's like, man, ain't this a blessing, boy? Right, the will of God. This is the kind of stuff. He's the kind of guy you'd like to take your sock off and stick it in his mouth. <laughs> It's like, Paul, you've got to be kidding me, man. How are you doing this? God is always looking at Paul, the Apostle Paul. He could find the glass half full all the time, not half empty. But boy, there's some weaknesses that come along with that. If you take a look at some of those things, look in uh, Acts chapter number 9. He's very passionate in that passage that I just gave you there. He desires for those individuals uh, to be saved. He doesn't mind calling them out. Doesn't mind calling, telling them what the problem is. You know why he's so quick to do that? He thinks he has the answer. Paul, Paul thinks, that I'm telling you, this is what's going on. This is where the problem is, and I got the solution to it. He's very self-confident. He doesn't back up anywhere. You don't see Paul in conjecture saying, well, I'm not really sure, and I'm not. I mean, he's just a natural leader. In a very short period of time, when Paul gets introduced as a Jew, you see Paul come into the party late, and then before long, he's the head of the party. Right. I mean, he winds up running the whole show. Look at this thing in Acts chapter number 9. Uh, pick it up, if you will, please, in verse number, oh, let's see, no, 13. That's what I want. Acts chapter 13. Look at uh, verse number 1. Pretty sure I had one in 20. Oh yeah, that's the one I got. Uh, uh, let me just read this one to you. In Acts chapter number 9 and verse number 20. This is after the Apostle Paul gets his eyes knocked out of his head and he winds up getting baptized. You remember the story? And then Ananias goes and baptizes him. The scales fall off. And verse number 18, immediately fell from his eyes that it had been scales and received sight forthwith and arose and was baptized. And when he received meat, he was strengthened and then saw certain days with the disciples which were at Damascus. And straightway he preached Christ in the synagogue that he was the Son of God. <laughs> I mean, you've got to be kidding me, Paul. No, man, he's ambitious. He said, I got my sight now. I know what's right now. I know where I was wrong. Where am I going to be? I'm in the synagogue. I'm going to convert him. I mean, I'm going right back where I came from, tell them I was wrong and this is what's right, and here we go. Literally just got converted. Man, you talk about, I mean, that's pretty bold. If you're that kind of a personality, you know what you think? You think the second that Darian got saved up here, the other, you know what you think? He should be out there on the street preaching with you. He should be leading people to the Lord. He should be passing out tracts every day. You say, why? Because you got Paul's uh, personality. That's good. Well, what's the problem? I did it. Why can't everybody else do it? Paul's self-sufficient. Paul doesn't need somebody watching over him all the time. Hey, listen, just because you don't need somebody to answer to doesn't mean that there may not be something wrong with you. It just means you don't like somebody looking after you. Right. Come on, man. That was Paul. And the Lord's got to change him in a little while here. Look at this thing in Acts chapter number 13. Acts chapter number 13. But I appreciate that. Paul goes into that uh, synagogue over there, and you know what he does? He starts preaching Jesus to them, and lo and behold, guess what? They're not very receptive. <laughs> and Paul could care less. Amen. 
Paul's not discouraged that they don't do that. As a matter of fact, you read later on, you know what Paul said? My desire is that they'd be saved. I wish myself accursed so that they could be saved. Paul never lost his heart for the Jews. The Apostle Paul, I told you this morning, when he got following the Lord and stuff like that, the Lord said to him, all right, I'm going to take you down here. And he said, no, I got to go to Rome. He said, no, I'm going to, he said, no, I got to go to Rome. Five times he's warned, don't go. But his heart for those people, he said, why dost thou weep and make me weep and break mine heart? Because I want to go see those people. The Lord said, because I said, don't go. He wasted two years of his ministry because he didn't do what God said. You say, what? Bullheaded. Can't be told what to do. You say, Paul? Yeah, Paul. Got out of fellowship with the Lord, winds up shipwrecked, soaking wet, and then goes up, gets on the beach, and winds up snake bit. You say, what? Oh, the Lord goes ahead and using him anyway, but he was heading him over there. He could have gone first class. You know what happened to him? He wound up shipwrecked because he went before God told him to go. Paul said, the Lord said, don't go. Sometimes you get doing the things that you think God's called you to do, and even God can't turn you around. You ever been that way? I done made up my mind. I'm, this is what I'm going to do. Okay, what if God chooses to change your plans? Maybe some of you might remember that message from years ago. Can God change your plans? Well, I don't know, can he? Sometimes storms are caused because you're going in the wrong direction and God said, hey, I told you where to go, Jonah. Well, I'm not going. <laughs> what a hoot. You're not going. No, I'm not going. I'm getting a ship. I'm going down and I'm going to Joppa. I'm going the opposite direction and there ain't nothing you can do about it. Okay, go ahead. And down he goes, man. Got his coat pulled up around his ears. Got his hoodie on, man. And he walks down on that thing. Nobody recognizes it. Got on his dark sunglasses and stuff like that. He gets on the thing. Goes sound asleep, boy. And that's what happens. You get them in the box. You can tell they're guilty. You say, why? They act like they're nonchalant. They don't care. They put their head down on the table. And then they act like they're, they're going to sleep. And you come there to get them. They, oh, I'm innocent. You're guilty as a day is long. Yeah. I mean, it's all over you. Some of you know what I'm talking about. You know what Jonah's doing? He's sleeping the whole of the ship. You say, what's he doing? He's trying to act like he's good. Everything's fine. And the Lord said, I said, go to Nineveh. I ain't going. <laughs> I'm already headed in the opposite direction. What are you going to do about it? I'm going to send a whale after you, boy. A whale? <laughs> A whale. It couldn't have been a whale. It must have been a great fish. Yeah, they've been running from that whale ever since they put whale in the Bible. The Bible says, as Jonah was in the belly of the whale three days and three nights, so shall the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth. Well, we know that a whale is, I don't care what you believe, there was a whale down with Jonah's name on it. And he came up there and he wouldn't take any other bait until that preacher went overboard. Preachers can call storms. You know what that jackleg does? He knows he's the cause of the storm. You ever read the story? He knows. He said, it's because of me that I'm where we're at. And you know what he does? He makes them cast him overboard. If you know you're the problem, why don't you jump overboard? You're going to cause everybody else to drown. But you don't care, you self-preserving rascal, you. You said, I ain't going. You know what it says? Well, I ain't going. I'm not going. I'm the cause of it, but I ain't going. I ain't going. I guarantee you, Jonah did not know that he was going to get swallowed by a whale and puked up on the beach over there. I guarantee you, he did not know that. You know what I know? I know he thought he was going to get thrown overboard and he was going to die. And the Lord said, no, I got some special transportation for you and you're going to go third class. And when you get done, you are going to smell like a whale's belly. And if you ever think you smelled bad before, I mean, you swimming around and vomit for the three days that you're over there. And all of a sudden, yuck, that, the fish says, I've had all this preacher I can take, man. All his whining and griping and complaining and belly aching. And the Lord said, you feeling a little nauseated I am? He said, stick your finger down your throat. <laughs> and he said, I don't have anything. He said, okay, use your fin. And he, you know, and he, bleh, and he pukes up. And next thing you know, Jonah's comes up on the beach, man, bleached out, man, looks like something, the wreck of the Hespers. And he steps up there and the Lord said, what'd you say about not going to Nineveh? Come on. Well, Lord, I thought when I got on the ship, there's no way you could get me here. Who would have ever thought he would arrange that kind of passage? But he said, you're going to Nineveh. And Jonah said, no, I'm not. And it became a matter of a struggle against the wills. And the Lord said, I'm going to use you whether you want to be used or not. He's mad the whole time. Yep, Starts preaching, has one of the greatest revivals with an eight word message you've ever seen in your life. The entire town, the animals running around in sackcloth. 
I mean, the horse says to the cow, what in the cat here, man? What are we doing wearing this stuff? And they won't even let us eat. We didn't have nothing to do with this. What's wrong? All the cow would say is moo. <laughs> and they sit there and they talk back and forth and the animals have got to be scratching their head and thinking to themselves, what are we doing this for? And one of them says, well, it must be real repentance, man. They mean business. I mean, we got to clean up our act, boy. I mean, I mean, they're even making us repent. They were trying to make sure that God realized we're, we got, we got you. Boy, Jonah should have been having a hallelujah good time, man. Elijah has the same thing happen to him over there at Carmel. And after that, not a single soul lost him in for a biscuit or, or a piece of ham or, nothing, or chicken or whatever. Never offers him in for anything over there, ladies and gentlemen, and winds up under a juniper tree. This guy's got real results, man. I mean, he should have gone out there and said, yeah, I preached and they all repented, man. What a great revival. You know what he did? He's sitting there mad. You got my reputation. I said they were going to die. The Lord said, yeah, but you also said if they didn't repent, they repented. Jonah, these people are so ignorant, they don't even know their right hand from their left hand. Would I be just in killing them? Yeah, you'd be just in killing them because I said you were going to kill them. I think you should kill them. I mean, what would that do for my reputation? The Lord said, boy, you've done forgot where you came from? Will Puke Alley? I mean, you got to be kidding me, man. I preserved you to come over here. And you know what he does? He sits there, he said, you're mad, are you? Yeah, I am mad. And then he takes the gourd and puts him, gives him a little shade. And maybe Jonah ekes out a, I appreciate it, but I'm still mad at you because you didn't kill him. The Lord said, oh, okay, good. And he sends a cut worm in there and cuts the gourd off and it dries up and blows away. And Jonah sits there mad. And then the Lord asks him a question. That, that book in your Bible ends in a question mark. You know why? The Holy Spirit wants you to know, would you be like that? What would you do? Be warm and worried about your reputation or His? Well, it doesn't last forever. They eventually have to turn on Nineveh and the Lord has to destroy the city. But boy, what a great revival they had. Well, pretty bullheaded, wasn't he? Well, Paul has that strength in him also. Sometimes you have this personality that the Apostle Paul has. You get so bound and determined to do what you're doing, you won't even ask the Lord about it. And you ignore the Lord when he's talking to you. Five times the Apostle Paul, who's given supernatural intervention and supernatural revelation of the seven mysteries of God that are there, five times the Lord told that boy, don't go. He got where he couldn't even hear him. He done made up his mind. I already know I've been in the ministry long enough to know exactly what God's doing. And I know when God's talking to me and when God ain't talking to me. And I'm going to go ahead and do it. And God's just going to give me uh, the ability to do it. God got onto his dingbat for trying to do something that was right but wrong. He wasn't going out and smoking dope. He wasn't going out and drinking, carousing around, doing things you'd consider sin. He had a heart that was breaking and a burden for his people. And he said, I'm going over there. And the Lord said, I said, don't go. I'm going anyway. You say, what is that? Boy, that's a weakness. Now all of a sudden, you're not getting your directions from the Lord. The Lord said, uh, did you not remember Acts chapter 9 over there, boy? You were on the road doing what you wanted to do, going where you wanted to go. And all of a sudden, didn't you wind up getting knocked off your horse over there and wind up down in the ditch blind? Got a short-term memory there, Paul? Oh, yeah, but Lord, I've been in the ministry now and I've been around for a while. I clearly see what it is I'm supposed to do. Hey, Paul, I need somebody that I can count on that I can control. Two years wasted in the ministry. Now that's not bad, all things considered, but two years there in a prison cell when he could have been out doing what God wanted him to do. You say, why? That was his own doing. And then he winds up shipwrecked. Look at this thing with the Apostle Paul here in uh, Acts chapter 13. Look in verse number 1. There's in the church of Antioch a certain prophet and teachers, as Barnabas and Simon was called, of Niger, Niger, however you want to say it there, and Lucius of Cyrene, and uh, that's pronounced Mahnehen, which has been brought up by Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. Notice he's last there. And they ministered unto the Lord and fasted. The Holy Ghost said, Separate me Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. Come over to verse number 7. 
And when the deputy of the country is Sergius Paulus, a prudent man, who's called Barnabas and Saul, and desired to hear the word of God. Look in verse number 9. Then Saul, who was called Paul, filled with the Holy Ghost, set eyes upon him. Verse number 13. Now when Paul and his company loosed from Paphos, they came to Pergia and Pamphylia, and John, departing from, from them, returned to Jerusalem. Look in verse number 16. Paul stood up and beckoning with his hand, men of Israel, and ye that fear God give audience. What happened to Barnabas? Look in verse 46. Then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold. You see how it started in verse number 13? That's an individual that before long, he clearly sees what it is that he's supposed to do. Come to uh, 2 Corinthians 11. He gets a good idea of what he's supposed to do and everybody else gets caught up in his wake. God's hands upon Saul, he's now turned into Paul, and the Apostle Paul says, Hey man, I've uh, set the course, I know exactly where I'm supposed to go, exactly what I'm supposed to do, exactly how I'm supposed to do it, and now all of a sudden Barnabas is taking a back seat, and this thing has led into such a sharp contention that when they get off of that boat over there, John Mark comes up there and stands with Paul, because if Paul can be quite heartless, he can be cruel, he can be nonchalant and uncaring. I'll show you a passage in just a minute where Barnabas says, hey, I'm going to bring John Mark. And he says, you ain't bringing him with me. Well, I mean, Paul, he's a young man. I mean, he messed up there. He shouldn't have done what he did. But uh, no, he ain't coming. I'll take somebody else with me. See you later. You say, Paul? Yeah, Paul. One of the problems with the Apostle Paul is sometimes a lack of compassion. He can be unsympathetic. He can be really slow to uh, apologize. He's not really good with details. And he can even be somewhat sarcastic. He can be a bit of a smart aleck. And at times he can wind up letting those things come out. You say, what is he? He's self-disciplined. He definitely doesn't mind dominating the situation. He doesn't mind giving him orders. He'll carry the orders out. I mean, he was probably the prosecuting attorney that was there. He would have been the chief of the police or he would have at very least been the, the district attorney. He had the ability to put people in jail and to put them to death. It didn't bother him at all. He felt like I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. I know what I'm supposed to do. Get out of my way. He's not corporately minded until the Lord seasons him a little bit. He's individualistic. Paul doesn't want somebody breathing down his neck and telling him what to do. You put Paul and personality of Paul in a situation, it won't be long. He's going to control everything around him. You better watch that. That's good. You better watch that. Sometimes you might have the personality of Paul, but you know what you might find out? The Lord wants you to sit down and keep your mouth shut. But it's hard, ain't it? You say, but I'm a Paul. Yeah, but Paul sometimes is exercising the wrong side of his personality. That's one of the things that transpires. And one of the things that you don't know or recognize or understand is, is that all those great attributes that the Apostle Paul has, he also has some weaknesses. And one of those weaknesses is that he's unsympathetic. Here's John Mark just getting started in the ministry. Paul rebukes the guy right there because the guy uh, confronts him and tries to create problems. He gets in the way and Paul blinds the guy. And John Mark says, wow, preacher, that's a little sharp for me. I mean, I'm not so sure I want to be in your ministry. I mean, I'm for healing the sick and raising the dead and, and giving their blind their sight. You just blinded the guy. And Paul said, see you later, Jack. I'm going on, man. If you don't understand, catch up when you can. I'm gone. Was that the right thing for Paul to do? You say, well, Barnabas, hold on a minute. Was that the right thing for the elder brother to do? Yeah. Hey, listen, you... Uh, 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 Paul, <laughs> sometimes everybody's not as mission-minded as you are. Somebody, pe sometimes people don't see what you see. They don't have the capacity to be able to process what you process. And sometimes you can be quite cruel with people. If you're the elder brother, couldn't you consider the weaker brother? Don't be eating cinnamon rolls around me when I'm fasting. I'm a weaker brother there. Well, preacher, you ought to be able to handle that and all that. I'm not joking. In that point, I happen to be weak. You say, why? You know if you've been around here any time at all, I've got a weakness for key lime pie, cinnamon rolls, and ice cream and biscuits <laughs> with butter and maple syrup. <laughs> Blackberry, preferably jelly. If I'm fasting or I'm uh, trying to knock a couple of pounds off or whatever, don't be eating that stuff in front of me. 
You say, why? She knows better. When I'm trying to knock off a few pounds, I'll tell her I'm going to knock off a few pounds. You know, oh, well, you can just stop eating and you'll lose some weight. Well, I'll lose some water and stuff like that. And then I'll say, but when you go to the grocery store, because she's got a tender heart toward me, and she'll see me come in from preaching, and then she knows I'm going to go look in that freezer, and I'm going to see if there's a little pint of ice cream in there. And I'll say, don't you go by there and get that. Because you know what I know? I know I should be able to say no. And I will go in there and I will open that freezer and she'll say, now you told me not to go by there. And I start moving stuff out of the way. And, I'm <laughs> and I'll find it. And I'll say, well, I told you not to. And she'll say, well, it was two for one. And I figured when you came off of the deal and she'll hide it down in the bottom of the freezer. Now, you know what? If you know that about yourself, what should have Paul done? What is your response should have been when John Mark messed up there? You think maybe you could have spent a little time explaining to him why he did what he did and maybe John Mark might have understood? You think maybe John Mark's ignorance was just because he wasn't like Paul? John Mark winds up being a follower. He winds up going right from following Paul to following his uncle Barnabas. You ever realize that when you're dealing with people that don't see what you see and don't know what you know? Can you have a little patience with them? I remember a bajillion years ago when I first started learning how to play a little bit of golf and things like that. My dad was a very proficient, very uh, on pro level uh, when it came to playing golf. He was there. He'd been a professional baseball player. When it came to a bat and a ball or a club and a ball, I mean, he, he, would, he could do some phenomenal things with that stuff. And I remember going out there with him and playing and having a whole bunch of guys standing around there and all that. And he said, okay, bud, it's your turn, you know, and you may want to tee it up real high. Everybody else is teeing it real low. He knew what I was going to do. You know, he knew how it was going to be. And I hit it and it got about maybe, uh, maybe an inch off the ground and squirted off over here and off into the woods and stuff like that. I sure am glad my dad didn't say, boy, I told you to tee that ball up. You embarrassed me doing what you're doing. You hadn't even been to the practice tee. I'm sure I'm glad he said, tee you up another one, bud. Maybe you want to tee it up a little bit higher this time. See? And over a period of time, uh, maybe got a little smidgen better at it, but it took some time. <laughs> For me, a lot of time. <laughs> I never was as proficient as him. I couldn't become him. I didn't have the talents. I did okay. But he never tried to turn me into him. Are you hearing me, Paul? The secret is somebody that has the talent and then has the ability to be able to teach people that don't have the talent they have. To just use whatever talent they do have. I appreciate Brother Roger up here singing. And I don't appreciate the fact that he tries to compare himself to Bellerer back there in the back that can beller it out, man. God's given that boy an unusual voice. You have to admit that. I just like him just like he is. I'm not interested in him being like him. If I wanted to be like him, I'd have him just get up here and sing. I like that I, I come to the garden alone while the dew is still on the roses. I can see that curl in a pig's tail right there. Roses. And he walks with me. I can see him walking. I'm not taking away from somebody that has a talented boy. That's not him. I appreciate he is what he is. He's up here giving a testimony for the Lord. His wife's in a nursing home. He's out there living by himself. He's an elderly man now. And he's standing up here and saying, well, I'm going to try. Don't be cutting yourself down. You're a blessing to me. Amen. Trip my trigger, man. I think, man, I hope when I'm that age, I'm still in the pulpit. You say, what is that? You've got to pay attention to the weaker brother, Paul. Your job is to pass on what God's given to you. You guys that are preachers in here, you got a responsibility on you to bring a crop up behind you and to try to help them as God has helped you. That's what Paul should have been doing. But no, man, especially at the beginning of his ministry. <laughs> Paul's ready to go. He's in the forefront, man. He's ready to take over. Paul shows up. You know what will happen? Before long, he doesn't let anybody do anything. Paul's doing it all until God fixes him. We'll get there in just a little while. I've got a few more minutes here if you'll bear with me. The Apostle Paul, when he started off, he's like a bull in a china closet. And he's successful at it. 
But success can lie to you. It can give you a false uh, uh, impression that everything's going really good. Just because you're being blessed because of your ignorance doesn't mean God will always put up with your ignorance. Amen. Paul was definitely good in getting some things done, but the Lord said, you got some edges. Have you ever thought for a minute what it must have been like for Jesus Christ to be down here talking to his creation and waiting on them to catch up to him? Can you imagine what that must have been like for him? He's listening to a, 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 a pound of clay that's telling him what they think about things, and inside he has to be going, I made you, man. I'm reading your mind. I know everything there is to know about you. I know everything you've ever done, every sin you've ever committed, and you're over here trying to tell me what to do. And the Lord's trying to fix them and trying to say, all right, let me see how I can best use you where you are with what you have to offer. Sometimes Paul can get ahead of himself. Are you in 2 Corinthians chapter number 11? Paul's real successful. Look at verse number 28. Besides those things that are without, that's what's come to the day to the care of all the churches. When you read down through those things in 2 Corinthians 11, you know what you find out? You find out that the Apostle Paul doesn't need supervision. He's not worried about adversity. It doesn't bother him at all. Perplexed and downtrodden and all these things. And yet he says, you know what? We're good to go, man. The bulls of Bashan circled me about and I overcame those things and I'm headed to prison. Paul says when he's sitting over there getting ready to die over there in Timothy, he said, I fought a good fight. I kept the faith. Henceforth laid me a crown of righteousness and for all those that love is appearing. Pretty brash there, Paul. Oh no, I'm, I've done what God wanted me to do. Are you? How come you haven't done it? That's Paul. Paul's not the best when it comes to sympathetic supervision. He's self-service. Look in Acts chapter number 23. Acts chapter number 23. I'll give you this. Paul ain't a quitter. Amen. Paul won't quit. These individuals right here, you know what they'll be? They'll be duty bound, man. They will do everything in the world they can do for you. They will not back off. They'll be some of the most loyal people you ever met. I mean to a fault. They'll be like over there with the old, uh, uh, Napoleon's troops that got surrounded, the old guard that was there, and they got surrounded up there at Waterloo, and they all had their guns turned on them, and the guys said to them, there was 30 of them if I remember correctly, and the guys said to him, he said, hey, listen, if y'all will throw down your guns, uh, get on your horses, and you can ride out of here. And you know what they did? They turned around to, uh, to shoot at them and had them kill them all. I mean, loyal to a That's Paul. Loyal to a fault. Be right there with you, the whole point. But sometimes that fault comes with hurting other people. Look at this thing in Acts chapter number 23. Paul has a tendency to be unsympathetic. He doesn't care if it hurts you. Paul's of the suck it up buttercup mentality. If you have that mentality, recognize everybody's not like that. Chesty Puller would have been a Paul. Chesty Puller was the most decorated Marine in the Marine Corps. You know what Chesty Puller said in the Korean War? He said when they got surrounded by all the people up there, the Chinese had moved in on them and the Koreans had moved in on them. And Chesty Puller said to the boys up there, he said, we got them right where we want them. Follow me or I die alone. And he punched through that group and got back to the home base. Chesty Puller would be that way. Follow me or I die alone. I'm going. I don't care whether you're going or not. That's Paul. But sometimes, you know what you have to do? You have to learn to slow down a little bit. And you have to learn to let other people come along the way because not everybody's been given that gear. Sometimes people don't get it as quick as you do. You're either bored to death, you're about ready to fall asleep, or you're thinking. You say, well, I'm a little bit more like Moses. I'm good with intricate details and different things like that and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, but you got some explosive anger, don't you, Moses? Well, but I'm really good with the, with the details. Yeah, but you have a tendency to be overrun and not accept the responsibility that comes with leadership, don't you, Moses? Yeah, but I'm really good with the tabernacle. <laughs> yeah, how'd you do with the Ten Commandments, Moses? How'd you do with following orders, Moses? All right, look at this thing here in Acts chapter number 23. Look in verse number 1. And Paul earnestly beholding the council said, Men and brethren, I have lived in all good conscience before God until this day. Oh, kind of bold there, aren't you? Kind of hard? A little sarcastic? Verse number 2, And a high priest Ananias commanded them that stood by him to smite him on the mouth. Then said Paul unto him, God shall smite thee, thou whited wall, for thou sittest to judge me after the law and commandeth me to be smitten contrary to the law. 
You know what he did? Jesus took it. Paul said, I ain't taking it. Look at verse 4. And they that stood by said, Revalest thou God's high priest? You know why God didn't kill Aaron and didn't give Aaron the leprosy that he gave Miriam? Because that's God's manifestation down here and God's representative was the priest. And you're not to touch God's anointed. That has nothing to do with the New Testament and stuff that has to do with the Old Testament. And you know what they just said to Paul? You're going to smite the priest? A little uh, unsympathetic, aren't you, Paul? A little uncaring, aren't you? A little bit harsh, a little bit hard, Paul? Uh, in 2 Corinthians 11, you know what happened? Come to Act chapter number 15. You know what winds up happening? In 2 Corinthians 11, Paul begins to mock and make fun of. And he doesn't mind using his position and what he's been through to do it. Paul says laughingly, They call themselves ministers, I more. And then he lists all the things that are qualification of the ministry. And we all know those are qualifications. But you got to get the tone at which Paul's saying that stuff. Paul is saying, they don't know anything about that. His personality is still right there with him. Paul said, I was a Pharisee of the Pharisees, above the law, blameless. And then I this and I'm that and so on and so forth. He doesn't mind using who he was, where he's from, and what his pedigree is. And then he said, but I counted it all but dung. Oh, you're starting to see a little change now, Paul. You don't have the authority that goes with that stuff anymore. Why? The Lord stripped you down. Paul's beginning to learn to, to be tender. You'll wind up here in the Apostle Paul in a little while here. You'll see him have tears and concerns and worries and compassions and things. That's not normal for this personality. They got another gear. They can be cold hearted. Paul's been killing people and still sleeping at night making orphans out of children and putting people in prison, thinking he's doing God a service and sleeping completely fine. I mean, he's on the borderline of a serial killer, man. And the Lord takes him right there and says, okay, I can use that guy. Boy, talk about task-oriented. That guy's task-oriented. Yeah, but he doesn't make but one Paul. It's a rarity. If you're that way, you know what'll happen? You'll be a rare bird in a crowd. And sometimes you know what you have to learn? You have to learn to lead from behind. You have to be quiet. Everything's not a dress parade, ladies and gentlemen. You know what Paul has a problem with? Two things. One, establish an authority. And if he's not the authority, he's going to take the authority. Until the Lord simmers him down a little bit. Are you over in the book of Acts 15? Let me show you a side of Paul here in Acts 15. Look in verse number 35. Paul has that superior mindset. I'm above the law blameless. <laughs> Bragging on the past. You ever talk to somebody like that? They always give you justification and qualification for what it is that they're doing based upon all that they've been through and all that they've ever done. And they always point to the degrees on the wall and this and that. You see that over there, don't you? You see all this, don't you? I'm qualified, therefore, to say this. If you don't have that kind of right there, they'll tell you sometimes you see some writing on the wall. They'll go up there and bump the wall. You got one of these right here? It says PhD on it. Well, unless you do, don't bother to talk to me. I got a PhD. I've read, I've learned, I've studied. You know what happens? You see at the end of Paul's ministry, he doesn't even minister, m mention what he was before he met Jesus. All Paul says when he's over there in front of Felix and Agrippa, he said, listen, I was on the road to Damascus. Paul doesn't say, hey man, I was a big dog. I was running with the big dogs. I mean, I used to be in here. I've been in all these palaces. I've been in all these places. I've sat right up there where you've sat. I know everything, the ins and outs of this place, man. I was trained at the feet of Agabus, Perry Mason of our day, man. I mean, he was the ins and outs and the who's who's of everything. I mean, I knew every law. There was you people sitting in judgment over me. That's a hoot, man. I bet you can't even read a Greek lexicon. You probably don't even know Hebrew language. You don't know Chaldean. You don't know any of that air America, nothing else. And you're sitting up there, a big dog. I know how you got there. I know who you paid off to get there. Paul doesn't do that. You know what he says? He said, I was on the road to Damascus one day and the, light, the brightness of the sun knocked my eyes right out of my head, knocked me down in the dirt and said, Saul, why don't you got me? And it's hard for you to kick against a prick. And you know what? I realized I was blinded, but now I see. And then he goes on and tells about what happened after his conversion. He doesn't go back historically and tell him all of his pedigree. You say, why? Nothing mattered until he met the Lord. Amen. 
You know what Paul's will have a tendency to do? They'll have a tendency to tell you who they are, Philippians 3, before they tell them what Jesus did. That's justification of why they have a right to tell you what to do and why you don't have a right to tell them what to do. You have a hard time taking order, don't you, Paul? You're self-sufficient, aren't you, Paul? You don't need supervision, do you, Paul? Hey, everybody's not like you. Some people don't like supervision because they're rebels, not because they're smart, but because they can't follow orders. And some people don't need supervision because they are very self-sustaining. Bear with me, I'm almost done. Uh, Acts chapter, I hadn't give you the one in 15 yet, right? 15, 35, just check and see if you're awake. Verse 35, Paul and Barnabas continued in Antioch, teaching and preaching the word uh, of the Lord which many, uh, with many others also. And some days after, verse 36, Paul said unto Barnabas, Let us go again to visit our brethren in every city wherewith we preach the word of the Lord and see how they're doing. Let's go by, see how they do. And Barnabas determined to take with him John, whose surname was Mark. And Paul uh, thought not good to take him with them, who departed from them from Pamphylia and went not with them to work. And the contention was so sharp between them that they departed asunder one from another. And so Barnabas took Mark and sailed to Cyprus. And Paul chose Silas and departed and then recommended by the brethren under the grace of God. And he went through Syria and Sicilia and confirming the, uh, the other churches. He's unsympathetic. Hey, I'm going to bring uh, John Mark. I mean, that was a while back, Paul, that you had the incident with him. Paul said, no, you ain't. And he said, hey, Paul, listen, I've been in this thing longer than you've been in this thing. Paul said, I don't care how long you've been in it. I'm not taking him with me. He's a stinking scoundrel. He's a deserter. And how dare him cross my word? I'm not taking him. And he said, well, I think he could probably still be used, Paul. I mean, after all, and it gets sharp between the two of them. These are guys that the passage before, they're preaching the Word of God. Right. And now they're having a split over a family member. That's Barnabas' nephew. Blood's thicker in the Bible sometimes. And Paul says, I don't bring him. I ain't giving him another chance. Left me out there twisted in the wind. I'm, well, Paul, I mean, you ever think about what it might mean to that boy to be able to get another chance? I don't care. He made his bed, let him lie in it. You ever been that way, Paul? Somebody crossed you, somebody offended you, and you're a little slow to be forgiving of them? Well, if he wants to get back in, how come he has to have his mouthpiece come? Why don't he come to me? Yep. Amen. Boy, Paul was great. Yeah, but he might have mishandled that one. I mean, later on, you know what happens? In nine years, Sir. something's changed. It's not John Mark. Something's happened in that nine years. Paul's looking back over his lifetime and he says, uh, bring my cloak and bring my papers and uh, uh, bring, uh, bring uh, John with you. He's profitable for the ministry. The Lord said, oh, now we're talking. You a little guilty conscience there, Paul? Because he didn't do it your way? Well, he's trying to do the best he can, but he's not a Paul. John Mark was never a Paul. Best I can determine, there was only one Paul. But you know what can happen if you have those attributes? You can be real unsympathetic and forget the whole mission is, we're trying to keep people in this boat until the Lord comes to get us out of here. And before long, you know what you can do? You can abuse your position. You can even abuse your position in the pulpit and use it to be self-serving. And then the next thing you know, the Lord will ring you around and say, what are you doing, boy? So it will never happen to me. Careful, Paul. Careful, Paul. Don't ever despise supervision. Paul had somebody looking over his shoulder. If he'd have listened to Barnabas, he would have probably been able to do something in nine years for John Mark. But you know what he said? I don't like him. Well, God didn't kick him out. Can you use him? Let me just give you a couple more here. Would you agree with me? Look in uh, Philippians chapter 3. Let's just look at that real quick and then we'll go to Barn. Philippians chapter 3. Would you agree that Paul maybe could use some gentleness? Could he use some long suffering? Could he use some meekness? I think maybe. 
I think maybe there's a couple of things there that the Apostle Paul might be able to do that he could utilize if he would have recognized that even though he was right on a lot of things, there were some weaknesses that were there. Hey, Paul, are you a little bit hard on people? You'd be a little difficult, expect them to know more than you do. Would you agree that Paul got a special gift? I think he did. <laughs> the Lord knocked him off of his horse and then met with him over there on the Arabian Desert for three years and spent some time with him over there and gave him the ability and gave him, you know, knowledge is a major thing. He doesn't even give him sign gifts, tongues and healing and all that. You know what he gives him? He gives him wisdom. He gives him the mysteries. Can you imagine that? He knew things nobody knew. Whew. Boy, that's a dangerous thing. Boy, you talk about your head swelling up so big you can't get it out the back door. Paul's given that information. You know why God gave it to him? To dispense it. But sometimes we get personality traits in the way, don't we? Maybe a little bit. Philippians 3, let me just read you just real quick. Pick it up uh, down there around verse 4. Philippians chapter 3, pick it up 4. Though I might have confidence in the flesh, uh, some did. <laughs> I, also, I might also have confidence in the flesh. He's being sarcastic. If any other man thinketh that he hath wherewith that he might trust in the flesh. <clears throat> you see it in a different light now? <laughs> you guys think you can trust in your flesh? Let me just tell you, I, I can trust in mine more. Paul's going to make an illustration now. But then watch what he does here. He said, I, I, I more, circumcised the eighth day. Now he's going to go through all of the things that he's done concerning the... And then he says, new man stepping in. But what things were gained to me? Those I counted but what? Loss. Loss. And then he goes through the process that the Lord put him through. In Philippians chapter number 3, this is after Paul has been spending some time with the Lord. And the Lord said, Paul, I'm going to take your personality, but we got to make some changes. we got to do some things that made you a great Pharisee, but now we got to make you a great Christian. And you have to learn to put a halter, a bridle on those things and bring those good attributes down a little bit and bring those weaknesses up a little bit. And let's work on those weaknesses, Paul. You think you can learn to be a little more kind, a little more compassionate, a little bit more meek, a little bit more long-suffering. Paul, you think you could learn to listen to your teachers over there? Agabus, your teacher's telling you, brings a girdle over there and said, the man that weareth this girdle will surely... Ah, Lord, I, I, uh, you're right. Well, didn't them other boys filled with the Holy Ghost come up? Yeah, well, Lord, you're right. Well, didn't I tell you that? Yes, sir, Lord, you told me. You know something, Paul? If you wouldn't always think you were right and everybody was wrong, we might have avoided some things in your life. He didn't kick him out. I like that. But Paul had to be willing to submit his weaknesses. I think sometimes the reason you don't submit your weaknesses is because you don't want to face the weaknesses. It's all focused on what you're good at. I hope it's helping you. I hope you recognize that even these great men in the Bible, that they have such great strength that sometimes their, their attributes are so magnified, they look like Goliath in the Bible, and you have to recognize the things that caught them were the little tiny things that other people didn't see because they were overshadowed by that giant of greatness that was there. But ladies and gentlemen, the balance of those things is where it comes to ministering to other people.